Good evening. Thank you very much for coming here this evening uh, for our Crossrail London presentation. Um, we have two uh, great speakers now this evening, so and it's it's fantastic to have them here for such a for such an opportunity for us. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to come. Um, this is uh, co-hosted with between Civil Division and Roads and Transportation Society. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Race, uh, Engineering Director, Civil Infrastructure with ACOM. He's the Program Director for Crossrail, uh, detailed design, uh, detailed design uh, since 2008. Um, he came from part of the Benheim Group um, via Scott Wilson and is now with, with ACOM. He's been involved in the delivery of major infrastructure projects in the UK, Ireland, China, the Middle East, Hong Kong, um, involving uh, road and rail infrastructure, including the Jubilee Line extension, the Fermoy Bypass, Blackwater Viaduct, the Riyadh Metro in Saudi Arabia, Starlight Rail in Malaysia, and Taiwan High Speed Rail Link. And in 2016, was elected Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. So uh, it's great to have, have you with us. And also introducing Jonathan Baber, uh, project director, Metro and Civil, uh, with Mont MacDonald. Um, he's account leader, International Metro, on the project, and uh, that's his current role within um, the transport division. He's led several design uh, aspects of Crossrail, and is a recognised expert in the field of immersed tube tunnels. He's active in the British Tunneling Society and the International uh, Tunneling Association. Uh, he's got 24 years experience delivering design for major UK and international in infrastructure projects and chairs the ACOM Civil Infrastructure Innovation Steering Meeting. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, call on our speakers now. Thank you. A generous applause before we start. Thank you. Uh, let's hope you'll do the same at the end, but we'll wait and see. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start uh, uh, speaking, and, th and then John will come up later on. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about the route and the funding uh, and uh, the design framework under which the detailed design was done for the central section. Uh, John will come up and talk us through some aspects of the tunnelling, and then I'll finish off by talking about just one of the stations, Paddington Station, and give you some examples of the design development we did on Paddington Station. So this is the route. Um, probably know about it already. It, it goes through the centre of London. The red bits are the tunnel bits. The blue bits are not tunneled. The blue bits are on the existing railway. So one of the important aspects of this job is the majority of it, in fact, is on existing live railway and need of all the skill sets necessary to work on in the live railway environment. The uh, money is all spent, uh, on the other hand, in the central section, in the red section, <coughs> particularly the underground stations and the tunnels, which are the things that John and I will particularly concentrate on today. Crossrail has a number of functions, but one of its principal functions is to improve the connections in London. It will increase the transport capacity within London by 10% when it's opened next year. Um, but one of the key things is you'll notice nearly all of the central section stations uh, are stations where there are existing underground railways, more than one. Uh, and many of them, in fact, 11 stations connect with network rail as well. In addition to that, there are five airports in and around London, and Crossrail improves the access to those airports um, significantly. Also con connects with uh, high-speed rail um, and, and Docklands Out Railway. So, Part of the purpose is improving the connections within London and also to connect people and um, the uh, employment centres. So here, the main employment centres are the West End, the City of London and Canary Wharf. So Crossrail, of course, goes through all of those. It also goes to Heathrow um, and uh, you can give some journey times there. But the other thing which I think is, is important to note that an extra one and a half million people are within 45 minutes of uh, commuting to distance to those places where people will work. So Crossrail is all about getting people in and out of London 
to their places of work. And it's interesting, it's not quite the same as Crossrail 2, which you might have heard of. Crossrail 2 is a bit more of a development project, and Crossrail 2 enables housing in places where there is no transport at the moment. Crossrail 1 is all about transporting people who already have housing rather than developing new housing. <coughs> Economic benefits, I'm not an expert in this. I find it slightly odd that um, uh, we, we, we can build Crossrail for 14.8 billion and we can get an economic benefit of 42 billion. Um, for me, that seems rather a good deal. I suspect we'd have to wait um, 60 years to get our 42 billion back, so maybe it's not quite worth as much as I think. But what is interesting is that it is a significant economic benefit, uh, and in fact, it's not just to London. Uh, many of the people who live in, uh, away from London think this is a purely London-centric project, but it is not, uh, and quite a lot of the um, work on Crossrail has been done actually outside London. So I'm going to talk through the history uh, fairly briefly, but um, you will notice by this that we don't do things terribly quickly in the UK. We started Crossrail in 1904. We had the centenary of Crossrail in 2004, and there was a dinner held to celebrate. It's been through quite a few different transitions and, and different versions uh, of course, post, post uh, the war, there were uh, looks, uh, ways to, to, to look at regenerating London. Um, 1974, another stage. 1989, now we're starting to get something quite serious. We've got two lines identified, which are now recognisable as Crossrail and Crossrail 2. Um, 1991, uh, we started doing some detailed design. In fact, the picture on the right-hand side there is Paddington Station, which and my colleagues designed uh, it between 1992 and 1994. Um, and everything was fine until in 1994, the government of the day, uh, as a result of the spending review, decided that it couldn't afford the project. Uh, but just uh, for amusement, it's not, you know, we think it goes back to 1904. However, this gentleman also thought of it in 1840. He was the first one to suggest across London Railway. So the current scheme uh, really started in 2001 uh, with a, a company that was called in those days Cross London Rail Links but is now Crossrail Limited and specifically that looked at what we now call uh, Crossrail Line 1 and Line 2. Uh, then th there was a bill before Parliament in 2005. It received its Royal Assent three years later uh, and that's when things really started going. Um, the powers that be start signing the documents that finance the project uh, and uh, design consultants are appointed for detailed design. So throughout the period from 2001 to 2008, we have been working, both our companies and others, have been working with um, uh, Crossrail to help them submit the bill for the, the, the Parliamentary Act and then support them doing the detailed designs, uh, sorry, the preliminary designs, getting ready for the detailed designs. There's a lot of work that's already been done before the detailed design starts in 2008. Uh, 2009, some construction work starts. Unusually, uh, 2009, construction work starts at Canary Wharf Station, which is being funded and built by a developer before the rest of the route is actually going ahead. Uh, 2010 was a scary time. Do you remember 1994, the Conservative government, after the September, uh, September uh, Comprehensive Spending Review, cancelled Crossrail? There was another review in September 2010, and we got through. There's a lot of work done leading up to that in terms of value engineering, trying to make savings on the budget. And then to, between 2010 and 12, all of the major contracts for the tunnels and the stations were awarded. 2016, um, it was renamed, or at least it was named the Elizabeth Line and will be renamed once opened as the Elizabeth Line. So uh, funding, uh, not a great expert in funding. Uh, this is a slide that Crossroll have given me, and it, it shows you that there are lots of different places where their, what they call their funding envelope of 14.8 billion come from. Um, and some of those are government bodies, some of them are uh, private companies. Uh, there's approximately, the way it works out, it's approximately one third of the money comes from the future fare box. 
One third of the money comes from government bodies of various shapes and sizes, and one third of the money comes from private industry in the form of planning levies and uh, money from BAA and the City of London. Really quite a complicated process. So I'm just going to talk briefly now about the central section framework. So this is the framework that was set up to do the detailed design. Uh, and the client came out to tender for these seven categories in the framework. And there were a total of 12 companies who pre-qualified under the framework for one or more of those seven categories. Uh, and after those seven categories, after those nine companies were awarded the framework, they then went into competition for the, each of the individual packages, and uh, nine of those 12 companies were, were successful in, in getting work out of the, the framework. Um, and this is, the, this is a combined slide of ACOM and MOT's work uh, on the project. Uh, and you'll see at the top uh, left-hand side, started in 2001, uh, where we were supporting the client uh, through to the submission of the hybrid bill. Uh, and then 2004, we continued developing the design uh, during the hybrid bill process. So there's quite a lot of work done up to 2008 when the detailed design starts. And you'll see that with, there's actually a total of 25 contracts here, uh, if you take account of the early ones as well. Uh, and between us, we've been involved in I, I don't know exactly, but significantly more than half of, of Crossrail. We've been involved in all of the underground stations with the exception of one. Done all of the, this is the advertising over after this, okay? I'll, I promise to stop at that. The, the, uh, all the, uh, the railway systems, the bulk power signaling, uh, traction, all that sort of stuff, we've done all of that, uh, and involved in all the tunnel work as well. So it's, it's been a fantastic project for both of our companies. We've worked together and uh, in parallel uh, as well. So I'm going to ask uh, John to come up and give me the chance to sit down for a moment. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as Mark said, I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview uh, of the tunneling on the project um, and dip into a little bit of detail in a couple of areas which uh, hopefully will, uh, will be of interest. The main tunnel section um, is constructed using conventional tunnel boring machines um, and there's 42 kilometers uh, of bored tunnel in total. Uh, 6.2 meter diameter, single track in uh, each of a twin tunnel network running the whole length east to west. Um, eight tunnel boring machines used in total. For those of you who don't know the anatomy of a, a tunnel boring machine, um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail other than to say uh, this is your conventional cutter head uh, where uh, the excavated material then uh, goes through behind the cutter head and is removed by a, uh, this is a earth pressure balancing machine, uh, has an Archimedes screw which transfers the spoil onto a conveyor and uh, that gets taken away. And right behind the cutting head, you've got uh, a hydraulic arm, which is erecting tunnel segments uh, as, as the tunneling proceeds. Um, probably save any more detail until discussion in the bar afterwards. Um, but just to say that, uh, as well as the TBMs, uh, there was quite a lot of work uh, done with spray concrete lining technology. Uh, and actually, that's what I'll focus on a little bit later, because um, it's perhaps a little bit less conventional. In terms of the tunnelling strategy for the project, uh, I mentioned there are eight TBMs in total. This shows where those TBMs operated. I'll just see whether this mouse pointer works. Yep. So there were two TBMs started off at Royal Oak Portal in the west of the scheme, uh, driven towards Farringdon Station. Um, starting just a little bit behind that, two TBMs starting from a temporary shaft site at Limo Peninsula, driving in the opposite direction towards Farringdon Station. Two further TVMs starting at Pudding Mill Lane Portal, driving towards Stepney Green uh, Cavern. That's Stepney Green Cavern down here, which I'm going to talk about in a bit of detail afterwards. Those two TVMs were also used for this short drive between Limo Peninsula and uh, uh, Victoria Dock Portal. Those were all earth pressure balancing machines, uh, mostly operating within the cohesive materials of London Clay and, and Lambeth Group. Uh, 
two further TBMs completed the tunnel drive uh, underneath the River Thames to the east, um, and that was uh, through chalk materials. That amount of tunnelling generates a lot of spoil. There's a lot of excavated material. Um, that was a big issue for the hybrid drill phase as to how that material would be handled, how it would be disposed of, how it would be transported in and around London. Um, so early on, a, a strategy was developed to minimise the impact of traffic on the city streets. Um, that involved uh, building a uh, railhead at Royal Oak Portal, where the, uh, the first tunnel drive started from and able to transfer large volumes of the spoil to a handling, handling facility at Northfleet uh, from where it would go onto barges and be taken away from there. Um, two additional temporary jetty facilities established in the east of London to receive further material. It was unavoidable that some of that material had to be transferred uh, by lorry through the, through the city, but it was minimised as far as possible. And it was great to see that 85% of the the spoil uh, was transported by rail or water. And where was it taken to? Well, there was a, a, a facility um, to the east uh, of London in the Thames Estuary, well, just north of Thames Estuary, River Crouch, um, and that was Wallasey Island, where I think this is a great story uh, to come out of Crossrail. It was, a, it was a major environmental benefit from the scheme. Um, where the spoil was deposited to create a, uh, a new wetland habitat um, and that's owned by the RSPB and uh, it's, it compensates for loss of other tidal mudflats in the area which are, uh, which are disappearing through sea level rise and, and climate change. So it's a really, really positive outcome for the project um, and there's some great statistics which go along with that. Um, in terms of the 98% uh, of the material beneficially used uh, in the 86%, etc. So that's a, that's a very, very good outcome. Um, so now to give a very quick, simple teaching as to uh, tunnel lining options, um, <coughs> which I won't dwell on uh, in a lot of detail, but it helps in understanding some of the, some of the following slides. So for lining a tunnel, um, you've got two options. You can have a single pass lining, which is a single skin of concrete, in effect, supporting the ground, or a double pass lining, which is uh, built up of two layers of concrete. Um, so Crossrail used um, the single pass lining, which is a segmental lining, the traditional concrete lining that's <coughs> used with the TBM tunnel. Um, there are options for single pass linings with sprayed concrete or cast in place, but they, they weren't used for, uh, for Crossrail. So two pass linings, as I say, this is built up in, in two layers and you can have an initial sprayed concrete lining to support the ground and then a second sprayed concrete lining uh, behind that. Uh, in this arrangement, it doesn't have a waterproofing system, so that's only really suitable for dry ground conditions above water table. Um, the two systems that we use on cross rail will use lower two. So uh, after excavation um, in the composite shell, solution, uh, you spray an initial lining to support the ground, then you apply a sprayed waterproofing membrane to that concrete, and then you spray a secondary lining on the inside, which gives you your permanent support. Alternatively, the, uh, the lower solution, a double shell um, lining, starts off the same <coughs> way, initial sprayed concrete lining to support the ground, and then a use of a sheet membrane inside of that and construction of a cast-in-place lining on the inside to provide you your permanent support. Um, and so I'll talk, uh, those last two um, are kind of what I'm going to uh, show you a little bit more of. But not before summarising the, uh, um, the board tunnel, um, for completeness really. It was pretty conventional, as I say. Um, machine diameters were 7.1 metres, and the lining inside uh, outside diameter 6.8 metres, inside diameter 6.2. Um, and before I get the question, the gap between the 7.1 and the 6.8 is filled with a, with a grout as part of the tunnelling process. Um, the lining is uh, formed by a number of precast segments, seven segments plus a, a, a smaller key segment which completes the ring. Um, steel fibre reinforcement within the concrete, and that's pretty conventional now for um, TBM tunnels in the UK. Um, well understood and well used. And for water tightness, 
uh, try and point that out. You can see a uh, waterproofing gasket which runs around the perimeter of each segment um, to keep it watertight. This image actually is, is, is a nice one. It shows the, um, uh, the hydraulic arm um, erecting segments. You can see this one is about to go into this space here and it connects with dowels to locate it um, and you build the ring round to the key and the final key goes in. It's been very successful and has performed very well. So spray concrete linings, which uh, I'll get into a bit, bit of detail on. Um, you've seen the form of construction, uh, or the, the form of the design rather. In terms of construction, four basic steps, I suppose. Um, excavation, in this case, you can see excavation there. There's a small pilot tunnel, um, which has been uh, formed in advance, and then excavating around that to widen out the, uh, 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 the tunnel. Then spraying, um, spraying of concrete, spraying of membrane which follows on behind. Um, then we move to, um, in this case, you can see the orange there is the waterproofing membrane. And this is the steel reinforcement fixed inside the waterproofing membrane, which strengthens the final secondary lining. It gives you your permanent ground support. Uh, and in the bottom right here, this is um, cast in place secondary lining. This is the traveling formwork, um, which, which runs through the tunnel to allow that uh, final lining to be constructed. The different types of waterproofing membranes have advantages and disadvantages. The PVC membrane solution, again this orange um, sheet membrane, um, was used pretty extensively um, and with good success. There's things that you have to be aware of with that type of waterproofing technique in terms of picking the right material so it's resistant to particularly mechanical damage in the construction process um, and making sure that uh, sufficient inspection um, and testing is carried out uh, of that membrane to uh, ensure it will actually be watertight. Um, alternatively, the, the sprayed concrete, um, sorry, the sprayed membrane approach was used extensively and probably the first time to uh, a, a large scale on the Crossrail project. Um, the issue there is understanding how that spray layer affects the behavior of the structural design and how much you can rely on it to transfer force from primary lining to secondary lining and get a fully composite behavior uh, of the lining. We did a lot of testing um, on, the, on, on the composite behavior it was a concern from a design point of view. Um, and I guess the lesson learned is, I would say, be cautious as to the degree of composite action that you rely on in the design. Nevertheless, it's a very effective um, form of lining um, and it's been, been used very uh, successfully on the project. Where do you use SCL? Well, in my view, you use it to create some really dramatic photographs, one of my favorite <laughs> photographs from Crossfire. Um, but really where it's best used is, is short lengths of construction, things like cross passages between TBM tunnels, junctions between tunnels, um, pedestrian tunnels in stations where you have difficult geometry, um, where you've got constantly varying geometry, it's, it's particularly beneficial. Um, I'll describe one of those in a moment. Um, and in stations, so station platform tunnels on Crossrail were, were uh, built using this technique where you need a, a larger diameter tunnel than you get from the TBM running tunnels. And you can open out the TBM uh, tunnel um, by breaking it out and building uh, uh, an enlarged SCL tunnel. Um, so it has its uses and it, it's been very effective. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in the subject, to go onto Crossrail's website, actually, they have um, a learning legacy site, which gives quite a lot of information about the, the pros and cons and when it's, uh, when it's used. So I'll just give you a little example of one of the areas uh, um, we've designed, Stepney Green Cavern. If you remember the route diagram, um, so as you get towards the east of London, the route diverges and heads north up towards Stratford and the Olympic Park and south crossing the River Thames. And that turnout required a uh, uh, tapering cavern of about 100 metres in length, uh, just over 100 metres in length, which was ideal for the use of spray concrete lining, so continuously varying geometry. 
Um, and I'll just show you some examples of uh, the, the blue section on the screen there, which is the widest part of the, the cavern that had to be constructed. Um, as to why it had to be built this way, well, there was very limited land available at the surface. So access uh, for the tunneling was through um, this uh, open slot. And so the caverns had to be formed working east and west from that, uh, from that site. Um, the difference in the colors, by the way, is different construction sequence and methodology, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. So that was the construction site. So as you can see, it's re fairly restricted access for getting plant and equipment down and, and spoil out. Um, and that was the construction sequence. On the right-hand side was the, the sequence we adopted. We looked at a number of alternatives, um, basically around um, how large uh, excavation um, uh, face that, that should be progressed at any one time. So on the left here, you see we looked at um, the side oval shape, which we call a sidewall drift. We looked at constructing that in two parts, um, and then the central core in two parts. Or well, the design we finally ended up with was um, larger single excavation sidewall drifts and a, a, a single sage central excavation. The choice, the reason for the choice behind that is mostly around access for plant uh, and equipment, um, safety, uh, constructability reasons really, rather than design per se. Um, but of course it affects the design because you have larger sections of cavern you have to design temporary support for. The geology we were going through at Stepney Green Cavern, um, you can see there we, we were passing right through the horizon between the London clay in the pink and the Lambeth group um, in the, uh, the, the browny orange below. But pretty good tunneling medium. Here you can just see uh, a um, snapshot of excavation in progress. So um, the picture on the left, you can see the sidewall drifts, uh, they've been advanced. Um, certain distance and sprayed concrete lining, primary lining applied and coming back here the, the machine in the centre is excavating the central core. Just to give you an idea of geometry, um, the width of the widest point 16.5 metres and height 13.4 metres, so it's quite a big space that's been created. Uh, and for the different support and stages of construction we had a whole variety of reinforcing um, designs for the lining sort of mesh reinforcement, lattice girders, uh, conventional bar reinforcement, depending on where you were um, and what stage of excavation you were. And it's always nice to have your GI validated by what you see when you excavate. So that's just, just a photograph I particularly like, which shows that horizon between the London clay and the, the Lambeth group. And what do you get at the end? Well, you get one of the largest caverns that's ever been excavated in Europe. Um, quite dramatic when it's, it's fully open uh, and fully complete uh, and everyone involved was very proud of the, uh, uh, that part of the project. The binocular shape you can see in the middle there are the, um, the soft eyes for the, uh, the TBMs to come through and indeed that's them arriving and connecting the cavern up to the rest of the network uh, and creating that turnout. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on safety issues. Um, certainly for SCL tunneling, safety is a, is, a, is a big concern. And Crossrail, I think, has moved safety awareness on considerably for this type of work. There's big emphasis from um, the client, the consultants, the contractor on safety procedures and protocols, making sure everybody has the correct training and the correct risk awareness. Um, the use of exclusion zones has been uh, um, developed and, and uh, in the most part very effective on Crossrail. Um, there's been a lot of real-time monitoring and survey going on throughout construction. It's now seen as an essential part of the construction process, um, particularly you know, moving on from projects historically such as Heathrow Express, Collapse, um, a lot of, lot of Things have been learnt and techniques and uh, procedures have, have improved greatly from then. And one of the things to mention, of course, is that the daily SRG meetings, safety re review group meetings, um, whereby every day the team come together and make sure there's a full understanding of the work to be carried out, the risks around it, um, and uh, um, what's expected. And I'll show you one of the sheets from that in a minute. And we have, uh, of course, on-call 
team for rapid decision making, which meant people in our tunneling team have to be available 24 seven to respond to issues which might arise from site. And the sort of things that we're looking at, just to give you an example of the, uh, the monitoring sheets where um, each section of the excavation um, will have trigger, trigger levels against it, quite well known in conventional process now. Um, and uh, if, if we get um, movement of the lining or movement of the ground um, uh, beyond certain limits, we have pre-prescribed response measures and uh, uh, can imp implement them very quickly. Just gives you a sort of example of the monitoring output we might get for any particular point on the lining. Um, that looks quite erratic, that one. I don't think it was as bad as it perhaps looks, but it just gives you a, a flavor of the sort of material that's reviewed on a, on a daily basis. And that's an example of the RES sheet, which is reviewed daily. Uh, it's the required excavation and support sheet. So that plots out every advance of the tunneling work and the ground support measures that are expected to be implemented, um, any particular risks um, to be ex ex looked out for during the day. And that's signed off by the client, uh, the client's consultant, the contractor, and uh, um, any, any design that they may have on board as well. Um, so that's all I wanted to say on the tunneling. Um, other than the SCL works have, have been very successful. Um, they've helped Crossrail a lot in terms of dealing with difficult geometries and they're part and parcel of a, any metro project these days, um, whether it's large scale platforms or small variable geometry issues that it has to deal with. Um, and I'll hand back to Mark. Good, thank you very much. I'm glad um, John was quite quite um, lively just at the end there. I was starting to nod off. I have to apologize. I just got, an, I just got off an airplane from a very long way away and I only arrived a short while ago. So if I nod off halfway through, uh, at least when I'm talking, I probably won't sleep. It's probably good. Um, anyway, so I, but it was fascinating and I was with you all the way. I won't take it personally. So uh, we're, we're going to carry on. I'm going to talk about Paddington Station. It's just one of the stations we designed, but talk about some specific uh, design changes that we made during the detailed design stage. So this is Paddington Station, um, long section, of course. In the background is uh, the old Brunel Station for the Great Western Railway. Uh, that is a grade one listed building, uh, of course, designed by Brunel, and therefore we have to be extra careful. And we're, we're digging a hole that's 250 meters long and 25 meters deep next door to his building. So we had to be very careful about settlements and make sure that we didn't do any damage to it. We also had to be very careful about how we would attach things to the front of his building without doing too much damage to the fabric of the building. So this is the solution uh, that we came up with. This is not where we started. And I will show you the difference in a minute. But just to give a flavor for what it's going to feel like, this is going to feel pretty light and, and airy. We've got a lot of uh, glass space over the top. Of course, one of the benefits of this station being a cut and cover station is that it's a big box and we can get some light in it. Mo most of the other stations are board tunnel stations. So there's a box at each end for the entrances, but the majority of the platforms are in board tunnels below ground. And it's much more difficult to get any light down there at all. So this is the uh, site and that's where the station box is. So it's bang next door to the uh, railway station underneath two roads, the um, Departures Road, which in fact was the taxiway, taxi rank in front of the station, which was moved uh, by Mott to the other side of the station as an advanced works contract, and also under Westbourne Park, which is the main road there you can see with a couple of buses on it. So it has a number of constraints. Uh, this is just a, a very few of them, but there are all sorts of constraints around a site like that, of course. Um, Principally, there's a mainline railway next door to it, and you cannot stop that railway. You can't stop the Heathrow Express. You can't stop the London Underground lines um, a, a, at all. So it's, it's quite a, a, a difficult site from that perspective. I mentioned already big hole in the ground next door to Brunel's building. Um, and uh, the original design had its entrance inside the Brunel station, inside the mainline station. And that meant relocating the substation, which fed all of the mainline station and some of the railway assets as well. That was a big deal. 
relocating that substation and keeping the, the station running. Also, it's a very tight construction program. As John mentioned, the first two tunneling machines started just to the west of Paddington, so Paddington was the first station that they got to, uh, and it, was, it needed to be built sufficiently. Uh, that's not, not opened up completely, but the end walls had to be in before the tunneling machines got there. So it was a very tight program, and that created some interest in the design as well. So just a bit of a flavour for the site. This is what it looked like in 1854 when the, the, when the previous building was built. And if, if you are interested, there are a number of uh, publications on Crossrail. The book on the left-hand side is the first of four volumes that Crossrail have published. And the first couple of papers in that are, uh, or one of them refers to Paddington Station, the other one refers to Farrington Station. And we compare the two, which are fundamentally different because Farrington Station is a board tunnel station because it's underneath Smithfield Market, whereas Paddington Station could be cut and cover because it was underneath the road. So this is the solution that um, Crossrail and its consultants had prepared in advance. Uh, and the entrance, just a couple of things there, the entrance is in the mainline station. So this is the, the edge of the mainline station. The entrance is in here. People walk below ground to get into the station. Um, it has a different difficulty of disrupting the station here and disrupting the shops in the station as well. Uh, and in addition to that, one, one benefit of this solution is there are no columns at the platform level. That's a very good thing. But there are, of course, escalators coming down there, so it's not as good as you might think. And one disbenefit is to get the loads from the top here out to the walls. We have these inclined struts. So this back of house area here, which is used for all the mechanical and electrical plants, was disrupted by the struts and therefore was not so easy to use. This is the solution we came up with. It's a little different. So now the entrance is not down below ground, but from ground level, and we drop down through escalators through the roof. And we've put in a central column, so we get rid of those triangular uh, spaces on either side. Just comparing the two side by side, at this stage I have to apologise. When I was going through this with John before, I recognised that the, the, the picture on the right has got stretched vertically because I'm about to tell you that on the right-hand side, the railway is not as deep as on the left-hand side, but it looks deeper. <laughs> so my apologies. You can actually see by the numbers it's not quite so deep marginally, but the, it's not quite to scale, the one on the right. But just to compare the, the two then, the... the for, for the public, and, and we are designing these railway stations principally for the people who are going to use them, for the public, the um, uh, wayfinding is much better. You can imagine if you're coming through here, you've got to go down below ground. See, it won't be dark because they have lights there, but they don't have to tell you which way to go. Uh, and it's not immediately obvious. Whereas if you come across here, you will be able to see the escalators, and you know you go down those. And when you get down those escalators, you th see the gate line, and then you see the next escalators down to the platform. Effectively, you don't need any signs at all. Really good wayfinding is when there are no nothing to tell you what to do because it's intuitive. We wanted to minimise the time that passengers spent below ground. Um, clearly, below ground is not such a nice environment as, as at ground level, so that's a, a, an improvement. Uh, we also have managed to create a public realm here. So this area here hopefully will be a good place for uh, cafes and, and, and that sort of thing as well. It'll be covered by a, a glass roof, so it should be quite a nice environment. There's improved daylight. There was some daylight in this solution here. There was effectively a window there, and there was some daylight coming down, but not much. Whereas here, we've got the whole of this section open to daylight, and the light will come down much more, and we'll get all the way down to the train level. I did mention before we reduced steps of the platforms, despite the way the drawings look. Uh, more efficient uh, use of the back of house because we've got rid of the, uh, the inclined struts. Simplified construction, because one of the difficulties with the scheme on the left is that there's nothing to hold this lot up until you've built all the way down to here. So you need temporary supports for that. And the one on the right, we also need temporary supports because we need to put the roof on to get the traffic back on quickly. But the temporary supports are columns, steel columns, plunge columns, placed on the centre line into the permanent piles, and those plunge columns are then eventually become the permanent columns. So we're combining the temporary and permanent works, making a saving in construction costs. 
less disruption to the mainline station is a big deal. Um, clearly keeping that station open and running, keeping all the shops open and running with almost no disruption is a very important part of the overall saving to the scheme. It reduced the program and it created substantial cost savings. In this particular case, we saved 17% of the construction cost by those changes you've seen. I have to admit, most of that saving came because we didn't have to make compensation payments to the, uh, to, to the station and to the shops in the station. And that was a very important driver to, to the scheme. And then just to finish off then with uh, s some pretty pictures, um, I quite like the fact that wherever I am in the world, I can look at a picture of Paddington Station that was taken within the last 15 minutes because there's a, a, a camera on the building here that looks down and takes this photograph every 15 minutes. And I was in, Aus in Australia yesterday giving a presentation about Crossrail, and I had a picture that had been taken 15 minutes ago, and it was quite useful. It, it did occur to me, I, I don't know if I can do it, I'd love to get all of those photographs, because you get a fantastic speeded up construction shot if you could do that, but I must ask Crossrail whether we can get that. So this, this shows uh, the, the, the main station box, of course, which is a box here. This road here was originally closed. And one of the unusual things about this is that the, the hybrid bill, which effectively was the planning permission, uh, was restricted here. It said that you had to keep two lanes of traffic open, one in each direction, throughout construction. And um, that was going to delay construction. Effectively, it meant that you had to subdivide the station along the centre line and build it in two halves longitudinally, which was going to take a lot longer to do and was going to be less safe. So I have some wonderful traffic engineers, and they managed to convince the local authority that the traffic was better if we closed the road than we left it open. <laughs> now, it's interesting, isn't it? In fact, what it means is that the disruption happened for a much shorter period of time, and we managed to do adequate compensations elsewhere, so that we, we did close the road completely whilst excavating, no, whilst putting in the diaphragm walls for the box, and whilst putting the roof on. As soon as the roof was on here, then the muck was returned, and this road was open just for buses. So buses were able to use it after a year and a half or something like that. And then the, the, the right-hand side of the roof, where the escalators come out and the various holes are, uh, is still open. So we've got, before excavating the, excava uh, the, the station underneath the roof, the uh, buses are back on top. On the way down, we didn't cast all the floors. Quite common to cast the floors on the way down. Um, but we chose to use some steel struts to uh, speed construction. And then... Um, this, this I mentioned before. Oh, wait, sorry, I meant to show on this one. These, this is what we mean by the uh, plunge columns. So these steel columns were installed from ground level before the roof was there, and the way that's done is that the board piles are bored from ground level, filled up with concrete for the bottom part of the pile, and then the steel is dropped inside the pile. That the concrete goes off hard, and then that's strong enough to then take the weight of the roof and the muck on the top of that and the buses. So these. Uh, you can see the whole row of them. The, these are what's called plunge columns, and many, but not all, many of them are subsequently encased in concrete to make the permanent works column. So there's a plunge column inside here. So we reuse the foundation. So the, the load always went onto that pile, and it continues to go onto that pile through the concrete. This is the opening for the escalators. There's some rather nice... Um, uh, circular concrete struts in here which are currently protected with this hoarding just to make sure they don't get damaged and escalators will run down here uh, one from each side or two from each side to the concourse area down here which is where you buy the tickets uh, and up here this is all uh, where the mechanical and electrical plant goes. Underground railway stations have a huge amount of mechanical and electrical plants uh, to, to deal with ventilation and smoke extract and all that sort of stuff so they're one of the interesting things about an underground railway station is that they're very, very multidisciplinary. Uh, I don't know whether I'm right. I think they're almost as complicated in terms of the number of disciplines as, as an airport. Not quite, but very nearly. Because there are so many different people who have different um, requirements of, of, the, uh, of the underground station. And not only that, but the contractors. There are more than one contractor working in the station. So... The contractor here was actually, the, the main contractor is Kostain Skanska Joint Venture, but they were not doing the track work because the track work is laid 
along the whole length of Crossrail. So Crossrail and Skanska had to build the box and then dedicate a part of their construction site for a different contract to come and work in. So these guys here are working for the um, system-wide track work contractor who came in after the box was largely completed with a separation between the two construction workforces. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. Um, and if we may, we open to questions. Is that the right thing to do? Thank you very much to both our speakers there. It's a great opportunity to be able to uh, see live and ask questions about such a, a huge en engineering uh, infrastructure project. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to come here this evening. Um, yes, we'll open the floor up for questions now. I just ask that um, you please wait for a microphone so that the people that are watching on the webcam um, can hear your questions. and. Uh, we're only allowed to ask questions until Mark falls asleep. <laughs> and then we might have to leave very quietly. So uh, the speakers might come up here and uh, we'll just run around with the mic. Better speak standing up, Mark. Yes, if I stand up, I'm less likely to fall over and sleep. So who's going to be the first brave person? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, microphone first. Thank you. Just to get it started, you didn't name the tunnel boring machine. Was it Heron Connect? Uh, okay, I, yeah, I think they were. They were they were all pre-ordered by Crossrail. Um, so yes, they uh, Heron Connect is the so I'm getting nods and orders from that as well. From and was the Murphy Company involved, which has a particular association with Ireland? Murphy's uh, were certainly involved in the the Thames crossing for I believe. Um, not sure if they were in, in the others, but uh, they've got a particular history of uh, tunnelling and chalk under the Thames, so they were uh, involved in it. Yeah. Thank you. Jerry Duggan, Irish Academy of Engineering. Uh, Looking at the section where the two lines diverge, or I forget it there, were there serious subsidence constraints on what you were allowed in that area? You indicated you had a small box to work from, which suggests that there were buildings nearby. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a common feature across the whole of Crossrail, to be honest, um, that the, the prediction of ground settlement uh, and ground movement and protecting the buildings was... Um, was something that there's a lot of attention paid to. I, I showed uh, snapshots of monitoring the uh, movement of the ground of the line, but the same amount of monitoring, similar amount of monitoring was going on at ground level um, to check that uh, um, settlements were, were greater than predicted. So um, yes, it was, a, it was an issue around Stepney Green Cavern, um, and it's, it's pretty congested, and there's a lot of heritage buildings in, in the area as well. So it was something we had to pay a lot of attention to in the, in the design work. Yep. Um, supplementary question for me, compensation grouting? Um, there was, I'm not sure if there was at Stepney Green or not. Um, there certainly was on the project. <coughs> but, I mean, there were, there were protective measures um, to control ground movements uh, implemented. Uh, Brian Duggan, ACOM. Is the use of sprayed concrete linings only applicable um, when you're excavating through overburdened clays or it can be used in uh, when you're boring through concrete? Uh, sorry, uh, bedrock? Um, yeah, it's used for uh, bedrock. I mean, uh, other parts of the world would call it natum. Um, so it, it, what we're talking about here is, that is soft materials, and that's a particular application of sprayed concrete linings, but uh, it, it's used extensively in other, um, other, form, other ground conditions as well. Uh, Conor McGuinness, Irish Rail. Uh, did the ordnance datum of the, the base of the tunnel vary much across the, all the, the network? Because I, I, I figure it must have been a huge job trying to tread this through all the tunnels that are already there. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Well, no, well, 
I, I, well, actually, there's a right at the beginning of John's section, you can see there's a, a long section of it. But it, it was particularly difficult at Tottenham Court Road. Uh, that is, I'm not sure if it's exactly to scale, but it's roughly to scale. Okay. But it was particularly difficult at Tottenham Court Road because they were going over the top of the um, northern line and underneath the post office railway. So, uh, and I believe I'm right in saying it's sort of this much between uh, the tunnels, which was sort of threading the eye of the needle when it comes to tunnelling. I mean, ideally, you'd, you'd be following the good ground conditions, but I think a lot of the alignment was dictated by going over under uh, line, lines of uh, London Underground. Yeah. And, and just a supplementary, your maximum gradient. I think it's 4%. And interestingly, at, um, one, one of the contracts we did was uh, putting the lane portal, which is the portal to the northeast, and it comes out uh, into where the Docklands Light Railway is. So we had to push the Docklands Light Railway aside and build a new station for them. But where it comes out of the ground, it's very constrained because at once uh, at the lower part, it's going underneath the River Lee, which is the river that goes into the old to, to the Olympics Park, and at the other end of a really quite a short site. It's going over the top of some um, old brick sewers, Victorian brick sewers. <coughs> and the, the alignment is very, very constrained. So it was too steep for it to be open to, to the rain. So even though we're coming out of the ground, it's got a concrete cover over it for some distance, simply because in the tunnels, I think you could have 4%, but in where it gets wet, it's less than that. And I'm, I'm not sure if I've got the numbers exactly right, but I think it's something like, Three percent when it, when it's going to get rained on. Sorry. Sorry, wait a minute. We just need to. All the time, we just need to for the microphones. <coughs> you, you you mentioned a heavy emphasis on safety. Uh, would you like to give us some numbers on how that worked out? Um, I, I know Crossrail published their their numbers. They can be on their website. I'm not sure I have. I have figures in my head. The, um, there were some incidents uh, on the project um, which went to the health and safety executive and there were um, certainly one notable prosecution that was in the press because um, unfortunately there was one fatality in the project. Um, but I think generally the, the number of reportable incidents was, was on the low side for the, uh, the scale of the the scale of the project, um, but in terms of exact numbers, I'd, I'd probably have to uh, point you towards Crossrail's website. I'm pretty sure they published them. Can I, can I just give a sort of personal reflection on that? As I, um, I, I've been in this industry for probably more years than I care to remember, and I changed my approach to, to safety as a result of working with Crossrail mm. because they were very focused on getting everybody home safe at night, and every week. Uh, there was a, 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 a stand down in the office and people would talk about some aspect of safety. And I have to say, I remember clearly thinking when somebody was talking about fireworks, what has this got to do with me designing a railway? Then somebody else who was there said, thank you for that because my son was hurt last year in a fireworks party. And I sort of made me think. What, it, what I realized uh, was that it's all a matter of mind, mindset. And as soon as we start developing the mindset that we think safely about whatever we're doing, whether it's at home or at work, it actually improves our ability to think about safety at work. So I, I for one, was, was a bit of a philistine when it came to, to some of the things which seemed to me to be unnecessary at work. And I've changed my mind completely. And I think it's, it's a testament to Crossrail that people like me have, have learned from that. And I think it's a testament that their, their state safety statistics are good. Not as, never as good as you'd want them to be, but better than they might have been if they hadn't had such an emphasis on safety. I, I, I'd support that. I had the same experience. And, and Crossrail, uh, they called it a target, a target zero uh, philosophy, and it was driven right from the early stages of design. And, and these, these, these sessions Mark talks about happened with every design team <coughs> in Crossrail's offices. All the design teams were, were together with the client. Um, and it, it really did change the culture. It drove the culture through, from the design through into the, uh, the construction. I think it was, a, it was a learning from the, uh, 
the London 2012 Olympics development, which carried through to Crossrail and is now carrying through to other um, projects like HST in, in, in the UK. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I had a question about the um, the uh, the boring machines, the uh, the tunnel boring machines. Most railway projects um, today use uh, boring machines which are twice bigger than these ones, and, and the purpose is to have the two tracks in the same tunnel, um, like in Paris today, where we build the extension of the uh, existing network. What is the benefit of having uh, one tunnel per track? Uh, minimizing ground movement, settlement control, if the tunnels are shallow. The smaller tunnel diameter um, gives you a narrower um, settlement trough above the tunnel. Um, if you're passing through urban congested areas, certainly heritage buildings, it helps you control ground movement and minimise the amount of protective works. Um, if you're deep enough, I would agree, uh, um, and provided you can solve the operational safety issues of two tracks in one tunnel, then um, yeah, why not? Why not do that? But if if you're shallow, um, the, the single track, smaller diameter tunnel is beneficial. It is a debate on nearly every metro project. Everyone goes through it. Do we do that or do that? And there's, yeah. it's six of one and a half a dozen the other. There are advantages to both of them. And surprisingly, the, the cost differential, when you, when you go through, it isn't, yeah, but I, I, not by a, a massive margin, I don't, I don't think. <coughs> we, uh, we do a lot of work with contractors as well, and, and weighing up options, uh, it's not massively weighted towards a single tunnel when you look at all of the other impacts. And yeah, and I think, I think the fire safety one is a significant one. If you have a, a second tunnel, you can get people out through that. I mean, it's, you, you can ball, build walls in the middle of the tunnels. So, you know, there are ways around it, but um, anyway, it is a debate. Just a question with regard to the tunnel boring machines. The 42 kilometers of tunnel boring, um, just a question on do you know what the average cost per kilometre would be for boring on Crossrail? Um, no, Big. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's curious. It's curious. Let's see if my colleagues in the audience have a number. I, I, I don't have a figure, but um, um, yeah, uh, we, we can okay. find, find that for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. Just the second question then, what would the, what rate would the tunnel boring machine be covering each day? Would it be like 20 kilometers or 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters? The, um, so that's some numbers that do stick in my mind. The, the maximum advance rate on the whole contract, I think was 94 meters in a day, um, which was, was quite something. I think typically you're looking at 20, 30 meters in a day, um, uh, but one of the contracts achieved 94, which was quite, uh, quite something. But 94 only on one day. Oh yeah, yeah, that was the absolute maximum anyone mm. got. Mm. So that's the, the, the top of the curve. Um, so I have a question in relation to TBMs. You mentioned that um, the machines were ordered by Crossrail. Is that not an unusual arrangement where the TBMs are uh, ordered by client for the contractor to work uh, with the it equipment? It's becoming more common, I think. Um, because of the lead-in time, uh, it, it, it helps get off to a flying start. Crossrail wanted consistency across the project here, um, knowing they would need an, four different tunneling contracts um, to help get consistency in the, pro the approach. Um, so there were clear benefits for the project here. And I, and I think you see it more and more now that uh, clients are prepared to, um, to take that step. I just follow on from that point. Um, it's obviously a massively complex project. Um, you, you only mentioned the contractual arrangements briefly there, NEC3. Could you expand on that a little bit in terms of how the client approached it and uh, how that you know, impacted on the, the final delivery and how it was, it was all arranged? Well, I could talk about the consultancy contracts. They were all NEC3. Okay. And they all worked really well. <coughs> it, it created a collaborative environment where it's in every, everybody's best interest to do a good job. We were all on target costs. No, that's not quite true. Most of them were on target costs. There were one or two that weren't for particular reasons. They couldn't be on target costs, but most of them were on target costs, and it worked really well. 
Um, it's the same for construction. Most of them were in the same target cost contracts. There were a few lump sum contracts around. Um, but they, they, Crossrail broke the project down into a lot of construction contracts. There were over 100 separate construction contracts left. Um, and I think they probably recognised because of the interplace issues that that created um, that target cost probably offered a, a, a better approach than putting everybody on lump sums because of the potential claims issues around interfaces and having to share work sites, as, as mm. Mark mentioned, on, on Paddington. Um, the second question. Um, just again, because of the scale of it and the, the, the length of the scheme, from an engineering point of view, what do you think are the, the biggest innovations that will be taken from this project and maybe applied at the next, you know, whether it's high speed two or, or the next tunneling contract internationally, from your point of view? That's an interesting question. Well, now, from a station perspective, um, the, the use of prefabrication started. Uh, in earnest, I think, on Crossrail um, for internal structures and stations. Um, with the work we did at Liverpool Street um, with the contractor, they they wanted a lot of precasting and prefabrication to speed up the construction process. And we've seen that follow through on, on projects like Northern Line Extension, where it's, it's been increased again. And I think that now is becoming the, the sort of default approach from contractors, whereas before it was kind of, um, let's try this, see if it helps see if it saves time and money. I think that's that's something which has come through strongly from Crossway. I think one of the other things that I think is stronger than it has been before is customer-centric designs, looking after the passengers, recognising that um, we're building a railway for passengers. And not, you know, I like steel and concrete, so I think the building a station is about steel and concrete. It's nothing to do with steel and concrete. It's about Joe Blogg using the train to get to work. And it's all about the, the people, and I think that's a, that's a, a, an emphasis which is um, increasing on these sorts of projects. I think you see it even more so on high speed two than we saw it on Crossrail. So I think that's an area. Um, and the other thing for me, I think the the contractual arrangements under the NEC, I think it's the first time they've been used at such uh, such breadth and 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 that sort of. I think that's a benefit. Uh, you, you probably need to have two contractors here telling you how well the contractors felt it went. Because I think the, the, it's, it's less obvious that it went well for the contractors. I think the consultants were very much part of the uh, Crossrail team. We had large numbers of staff mobilised into Crossrail's offices working together pretty seamlessly and the contracts <coughs> were necessary and they did get sorted out and we did have arguments but we solved all the arguments pretty quickly. Um, and that's what NEC tends to, to, to generate. Sorry, <coughs> just an add-on there um, to that previous question. So just so if I'm clear, the Crossrail is almost like a public sector uh, 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 holding company that was was established to implement the design, the construction kind of uh, uh, subcomponents. So you were talking about client design there. So in some, in some, like, was there an element of design and build for certain packages? In other circumstances, you know, you were a direct designer to Crossrail, or was there a bit of a hybrid, or, or did it depend on the work package? No, there was. It was definitely a bit of a hybrid. So one of the things that uh, happened. Um, the officially, the station contracts were mostly left as design and build contracts. The trouble is, not the trouble, the reality is the design was largely done. The, one, the, the, the two areas which were not done at that stage were the, the detailing of the mechanical and electrical plants. So we did more like a reference design for the mechanical and electrical, which is generally a good idea because you really want to have the subbies on board when you're doing the detailing of it. So that was passed lock, stock and barrel to the contractors and the uh, this was not the original intention, but the client started running out of money for design, so he asked the contractors to finish off the architectural detailing and the structural detailing. So on, on, on Paddington, for example, we had already, at the time that decision was made, we had already done full reinforcement drawings for the diaphragm walls. But we didn't then do di full reinforcement drawings for everything else. We did design intent drawings, and the contractor produced the reinforcement drawings uh, and his own schedules for the rest of it. So. There was definitely an element of design and build, but it was a relatively minor element. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's correct. And, and I think very, uh, 
little bit station by station, contract by contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so on the spray concrete liners contract, for example, we work with contractors and we completed the, the design. Um, so <coughs> it, it's a little bit, little bit mixed across the project. Okay. Uh, well, that brings me neatly onto my next question, was more technical, technically based. It was just it occurred to me when you were showing the pictures of the, the lining technology, um, y you know, what it, some of it looked like it was a, it was actual a physical layer, not sprayed on. Is that correct? Or was it all sprayed on, sprayed on linings? Uh, the mem so there was a membrane uh, shown in one of the images. Yeah, yeah. so the, um, the two different approaches were uh, spray your primary lining concrete to support the ground. Then uh, for the waterproofing layer which comes next, there's a, a, an option of either spraying your waterproofing membrane onto that concrete or attaching a sheet membrane. Okay, okay, well. Uh, the inner lining follow. Well, that was just my question. I was just, obviously tunnels being tunnels and by their essence there, water is a challenge. Uh, what would be the design life for that for that membrane? Would it be 120 years or? Or whatever the case would be, is that is that possible for products like that? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's it's a question for the suppliers, really, that they can never answer how long your material lasts. Okay. You, you have to be pragmatic about it in the end because you can't you can't get back to it to do anything. Exactly. Um, yeah, so yeah. those sort of materials, you have to do as much as you can in terms of age testing and due, you know, deterioration due to exposure to either oxygen, water, or deleterious material. Uh, material okay. you. so um, they're in a pretty protected environment and there's not much can get to them um, so chances are they'll last most of the design life but no one would ever sign a, a, a guarantee that that would be the case I don't think. Uh, sorry sorry Mark uh, I'm conscious that you're still tired uh, do you need a seat you're okay to take are you okay to field the field a few more questions yeah Okay, well, this is just... Thank you. Uh, Peter Cuff, IRSC. I'm a railway signal engineer. I noticed at the start that you had a figure up there are 24 trains an hour. Now, I won't bring you out of your comfort zone talking about um, signaling, but 24 trains an hour says to me practically 110, 115 seconds between trains, potentially. Can you teach us lessons about shifting that many passengers through stations and corridors and barrier lines in an underground station? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real challenge um, and, and requires... Uh, obviously very detailed modelling, so we, we all use metering or something similar to that to, to do the modelling. Uh, you've got to make sure that you've got um, the right number of escalators, the right number of staircases. You've got to make sure you don't have people going all to one end of the platform, so there are always people at both ends of the platform. Uh, the, the, the typical uh, stations have got platforms with entrances to both ends. Paddington had the benefit, actually, that the escalators came down not at the ends, but a bit further in. So you had people walking in four directions to get to the escalators. It's really just a matter of modelling. Uh, and we were able to make some, some cost savings on Paddington, getting rid of some escalators by careful modelling. Um, but you have a huge number of people. These, these um, uh, trains have, I can't remember how many people on? Five car trains. Yeah, so, so actually, they're actually 11 car trains. It's not as strange. The, for some reason, the trains, the, the cars stretched and then had less of them from the start of the design. But anyway, uh, but I think it's something like 1,800 people or something on each train, and they're coming through at that you know, regularity. It's, it is, no, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. Okay. Still, we'll carry on. Uh, well, they, they um, brought in, they had a project a delivery partner, um, which we should know about because ACOM was that, in part of that. Um, and they also brought in uh, a group effectively led by Bechtel. So, um, sorry, Bechtel, I'm so sorry, I got that wrong. Project program partner was uh, a group uh, led by ACOM, and effectively that was staff seconded into Crossrail to help manage themselves. Then there was a project delivery partner who were the, if you like, the, the, the program managers standing between Crossrail and the consultants. And that worked quite well. Um, but the difficulty for, with, with the way it was set up during the design was therefore the consultants had two people to keep happy. The, the uh, project delivery partner, and only when they were happy 
to the design get passed on to the clients, and then they're now <coughs> progression. So signaling was a big problem. Signaling was a big problem because we were doing things which were unusual. We've got surface route type signaling and underground signaling. I'm now getting outside my comfort zone, but they are different, I believe. You know, one of them is a timetable and one of them is not. And it makes a fundamental difference to signaling. And the two different clients had different views as to what we should be doing. It made it almost impossible to achieve what we needed to do in the time scale. So I think there were difficulties. And eventually what Crossrail did is that they absorbed the project delivery partner into Crossrail's organization. So there was originally quite a lot of man marking towards the end of the design and during the construction that was, that was removed. Uh, but they, it was a huge organization, an awful lot of people managing a lot of people doing stuff as well. I think I think the this is being recorded, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> there was a lot of emphasis on value engineering, a lot of ideas put on the table. Very few of them actually went through, and that's partly because of what I talked about before, and there were different views as to the value of changing the construction cost and program. And there's a tension. If you're going to do value engineering, you're going to delay something. And there were some parts of, of our total client body who were very keen on the program, and others more keen on price. And they, they took a, a view on all the, the value engineering ideas that came, uh, we brought up. And some of those were taken into account. There was one unusual one that um, happened and made, it, made a significant difference. Uh, at the time of the um, comprehensive spending review, Crossrail decided to change the tunneling strategy around Farringdon Station. You may remember from what John said that the tunnels both met at Farringdon Station. But actually, in the original design, they stopped at either end of Farringdon Station because of the program. And the intention was to buy another tunneling machine, a much smaller one, to do the pilot tunnels for the two platforms. Uh, and one of the changes that was made by Crossrail in advance of the spending review is to say, OK, we're going to extend the program allow these tunneling machines to go through to meet at both tunneling machines meeting at this end, and we don't need to buy a new tunneling machine. And it's very rare that you extend the program of construction and you save money. But that particular case they did. So there were things like that. So there were some significant changes. And later on, there were uh, value engineering changes uh, under the, the process called uh, what was it? They call it IC? O o OCI. OCI. Optimize. Optimize? Optimize Con contractor, contractor involvement. involvement. But that was, uh, it was a process that was, was brought in not really to value engineer the scheme because at that point, Crossrail mm. didn't want a lot of change. It really was around uh, helping contractors reduce risk um, and matching things to their preferred methodology but without substantial change. I, I think it was quite an effective process but it didn't lead to, to major change. The around the spending review, there was a real push to value engineer the scheme because in 2009 the costs had crept up um, and I think it got as far as 16.1 or 16.2 billion and so there was a big effort by all the design organisations working with Crossrail and the, the technical partner to bring that back down again to the 14.8 and it was, it, was, it was a successful drive and it was a very con concentrated effort by everybody to, to, to find savings where they could. And it, that even involved challenging the basic requirements of the project if, uh, if it would um, get that, that budget back down to where it needed to be. Um, well, there was talk about leaving stations out, for example. Didn't actually do that in the end. No. But that, that sort of, you know, they were looking at some fairly fundamental things. Yeah. But it was successful in getting the, the budget back down, so it was, it was good. Um, Jonathan, hi. Um, if you don't mind, I was just going to ask a couple of tunneling questions. Um, how, how did the volume loss transpire from assessment to outturn? You know, for the 
TBM and the SCL work. And then my second question was the waterproof lining, was that mandatory or optional? I know there's a, a debate with tunnels as to whether you can remove the waterproof lining, but for Crossrail, was it mandatory? Um, okay, uh, yeah, so volume loss, the, the client specifications were 1%. Um, and uh, it obviously varied through the job, but I think pretty much uh, was achieved and, and quite a lot less than the 1% value uh, across the project. So it was a, it was kind of a conservative um, approach for the ground conditions. Um, I don't have exact figures, but I think it was probably closer to the sort of half percent sort of, uh, sort of mark. So um, they did a good job in, in controlling the, the ground movements from that point of view. Um, membranes were mandatory. Um, there, it, it was, um, as, as to when the spray uh, system was used or the uh, sheet uh, system was used, um, was left a little bit open at the beginning. Um, we soon honed in on where we wanted to use that for um, uh, for the project. But uh, yeah, it was it was a requirement that that would be there. Uh, Kaiser Shulky, uh, formerly of Hill International, uh, currently Dublin City Council. Uh, I'd like to ask you: Was there any unexpected water leakage? Uh, that you didn't expect, you know, in locations where you didn't expect, and how did you deal with it if, if it happened? Um, Tunnels, that definitely. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not aware on the, the, the contracts I was involved with. I'm not aware of any particular. So, issue. despite all the measures that you've taken of water yeah. and so on, I, th I think the biggest risk areas were probably in the cross passages, and I know they they had to do a lot of depressurisation work. Um, to manage groundwater ahead of starting the, con the construction cross passages. Um, I'm not aware of any major inflows. I'm looking around. Uh, no, no, not getting any. Yeah, yeah. And th there were uh, there was some large scale dewatering towards the east of the scheme as well, which w which helped with that. And then local depressurisation. So it, it wasn't a major issue to my knowledge. Uh, final question: Where did you bury the tunneling? machines at the end of the project? <laughs> uh, I think I think they were all taken out. I'm not sure there were any lost. No, I, don't, I, don't think, I think some shields are left behind, but I think some tunnel machines were all taken out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we don't reuse tunneling machines more than we do, but I mean, they do tend to wear out. They need a lot of refurbishment to, to be reused again, but in theory, they can be, I'm sure. Yeah, refurbishment costs can be surprisingly high. Yeah, almost the cost of a new machine. Yeah. Yeah. Final one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope he would. I hope he would. <laughs> In fact, the, the, the biggest effort, and this may sound a little strange, but the biggest effort was uh, the, the glass canopy outside the front. We knew we had a problem with, of, of settlements, so we just put in a top-down solution. It was going to be stiff enough. It wasn't a problem. But the glass canopy and how you fix it and who saw which bit of it, that took forever to get sorted out. So I hope he would have appreciated that. very much again I think we've kept everybody long enough but um, we would like to uh, say you're very welcome to join us in Cafe Clyde after this um, thank you again to ACOM and Moff MacDonald um, just for Roads and Transportation Society our next uh, lecture is from John Heffernan of Dublin Airport Authority that's on Tuesday the 14th of November here um, on the new runway so um, that should be an interesting one and, and the associated infrastructure with that um, I'd just like to call on our colleagues from Civil Division now, uh, Donal Minnick from TII, just to give their vote of thanks.
just to know in terms of attendance is there not always as twice as many as, as generous as they are here uh, myself and Carl and the guys will know that there's, there's times where we've sat in the, on, on certain places where there's been six people in attendance and we can go off to Bill to, to be burn his wife <laughs> <laughs> Sincere thanks to Mark and Jonathan on a, a, a fantastic contribution tonight and sharing your, your, your taps of knowledge and your experience on such a such a, a, a flagship project that uh, um, you know at a strategic level I suppose in terms of of, of PRI I suppose from a, from my own perspective from my public transport colleague my, my colleagues uh, uh, there's insights to be seen in there in terms of uh, what it was particularly noteworthy the focus on the connectivity direct and indirect for five air ports in Dublin. I think that further emphasizes the point of what needs to be done in this country and what needs to be done in Dublin Airport and our own ambitions in terms of just providing that and the optimizing of promote pro uh, promote projects. Uh, I also thought it was very interesting and it's very topical in terms of the engineering fraternity and, and society here, which is the housing crisis that we have and how your 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 Crossrail Zoo project is focused on, you know, Crossrail One was about the 45 minute commute time, Crossrail Two was about providing the opportunity to build houses people living in places with a, within a commuting proximity to uh, 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 work centres which is uh, again I think it's been commended in terms of the floor space and perhaps something that uh, a lesson that could be learned here with the clever building that's been allocated in this country to promote uh, social mobility for all people. Obviously then you share your, your technical experiences in terms of your, your supply strategy the, 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 the 85 percent of the supply to be uh, transported or removed off road <coughs> and obviously then Hopefully, what we will do in this country and uh, in terms of the delivery of rollout of our own.